Hi, Steve. I'm glad Hi. to meet with Zahir today. Me too. I'm you glad did. to be here. Thank you. We're talking about the uh, Donbass uh, region and their uh, struggle for self-determination there previously, Steve, I think. And this is appreciated by those of us who are not enchanted by the corporate media and their uh, pro-NATO position, basically. I, I think there's various you know, ways in which uh, Ukraine was uh, already working with NATO as a de facto satellite of the NATO war alliance. And, uh, you know, especially now with the funding of the neo-Nazi groups, you know, it's, it's turned into uh, an urgent uh, situation. I'm uh, glad that the uh, uh, Lugansk uh, People's Autonomous Republic is now entirely liberated. Don, uh, the uh, Donetsk uh, People's uh, Autonomous Republic is about half liberated. But I think the Russian troops are coming in from behind, you know, to take care of the uh, neo-Nazis there who are using the uh, civilians as a human shield. Well, you know, um... I, I want to say, I want to share something to our, our our listeners and viewers that maybe we, you know, we don't think about. And just to put something in some context, you know, us in the United States and even, yeah, us in the United States, we are used to battles such as sit-ins, picket lines, demonstrations, boycotts, um, maybe taking over a freeway, um, maybe Molotov cocktail, uh, may, you know, something on a very limited basis as far as um, how to fight back and the, do, do community self-defense. I don't think we have a good sense, not because we're not intelligent, but just things are changing in the world. And now we're seeing fights where countries are getting involved in large scale politics through warfare. And I think we have to um, expand our view on what politics really is and what warfare means and what role the United States always plays in any conflict. It is never progressive. It is never revolutionary. It is always kind of revolutionary. It is always evil. So if the United States essentially is saying that um, people in the United States have to have higher gas prices, and higher food prices and higher everything to help Ukraine. Clearly, the United States is, is defending evil or it's evil. There's never a case where the United States is correct. And when it comes to warfare, um, it's terrible to see people who are dying on all sides. And I do mean that. Soldiers as well as civilians. However, war, war involves people dying and it's not pretty. I've seen a lot of things um, in the media from people on the front lines you don't see on NBC and CBS that really shows the tragedy of how civilians are uh, caught up in this situation because the Ukrainian military and government is dominated by fascists and how they want a racial war, ethnic war against the Russian population. Mm -hmm. And it's not pretty, it's never nice, it's nothing to... to uh, and to be joyful about, however, politics does operate that way. And that's just, I think we have to learn from this situation. At least there's a, there's a lot of things that we can learn. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, that reminds me of two Malcolm quotes, you know, uh, revolution is, is bloody. And it, if you knew what revolution was, you, you wouldn't even use it in your vocabulary. And then uh, number two, you know, um, Malcolm was talking about, you know, how the media, don't let the media tell you who your enemies are. I think this is a very important thing that we have to get back to, is, is going back to that real study and try to connect with organizations on the ground uh, uh, and try to connect with different people. Because when we look at the media, we know that if they're all pushing a particular pro-Western agenda, there is no objectivity. We should just assume that uh, off basis uh, and always try to get our own independent uh, sometimes there won't be a media source that, that will even uh, show the complexity of some of these issues. And so it's, it's going to be up to us to, to plug into the correct sources and, and try to formulate these opinions and, and do our own blog websites, 
you know, we got to start getting back into getting our own uh, writing and putting that out there. And there's, it's, it's easier now because we got YouTube and all these different social medias, but I'm seeing a lack of, uh, of, of organization positions, you know, on these type of things like, hey, we see this and we break it down on this level. So I think that that's something we, we, we got to get back to. You know, when I first wrote the article on the Donbass uh, national liberation struggles there, which at first, you know, we're willing to remain as autonomous uh, republics, you know, within the Ukrainian Federation, but then the Federation was turned into the uh, typical nation state, you know, much like uh, what Zionism does and uh, excludes, you know, anybody else, you know, who is not a member of the principal nation. So then it struck me that the same thing applies to the United States of America. You know, you have the black belt there, which is divided into little chunks, you know, of other states so that the black nation, you know, uh, residents are not represented any more than like 30% in each of these states. So they never have a majority anywhere. There's like a scheme, you know, to divide out and conquer, you know, yeah. the indigenous population of, of the black nation. So if you look at the other maps that I included in the article that I wrote that show the population density, the demographics, you know, of each, you know, nationality, well, then you see, you know, like the strength and the power of what a, of the black belt, you know, and what it is. And Atlantic Georgia, you know, seems to be like the capital of this black belt. So, you know, I started to apply the same criteria that, you know, I learned from the, the Jewish Bundist uh, milieu that I come from of, uh, you know, nationality seeking their self-determination by national cultural autonomy or, you know, national cultural territorial autonomy. And this would apply to the black belt. You know, that's like should be an autonomous republic within the North American Federation. And then, you know, there could be majority control of the black nation over itself, internal self-determination you know, and, and, and democracy. Otherwise, you know, there is no democracy for a national minority. You know, that, you know, Jewish people know that, and I think black people know that as well. I was going to say too, that's important to conceptualize this in that way, like black nation, because um, like what you said, you see how it's cut up and, and they take away like some of that voting power. And so like, we have to think about it in that kind of revolutionary sense, because then we could see why gerrymandering, when they cut up these votes, how it takes away black votes, how that could undermine self-determination for black people. But then, you know, somebody else could co-opt that and say, you know, well, you got to get better voting power for, uh, you know, keeping up the American uh, nation state. You know, it could be co-opted to, to, to this type of reformist strategy. But it's, it's, but if we got to understand it in terms of uh, Black self-determination, I think that that's important because it allows us to then say, what do we need? It, it, it gives us better strategies uh, to how we need to go about it instead of just saying, you know, we're not going to participate in this or that. We could say, this is why we're going to do this, you know? Yeah, strategy. Strategic approach, long term, yeah. Right. Yeah. I think uh, Steve uh, agrees, but maybe he's you know stepped out of the room for the moment. But uh, it's uh, it's it's one of the first things that uh, impressed me in terms of uh, implicating myself in the struggle in the '60s. You know, when I was a teenager, and. Uh, you know, I heard, uh, somehow I heard, you know, there was going to be a SNCC meeting, you know, downtown in a, at a bar, you know, so I went looking for it, but never found it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, the Vietnam took over, you know, the uh, political space, you know, as well in Canada, you know, we had to sort of organize uh, the massive demonstrations for that. And uh, it was funny, you know, because we had two demonstrations happening at the same time. Uh, because, you know, we had the CP-led demonstration, you know, for peace in Southeast Asia. And then we had the anti-war, you know, demonstration that uh, we were organizing. I was in the uh, Trotskyist movement at the time, because they're the only mm. one who would accept, you know, a Jewish Bundist like me. They ignored what I was doing, you know, like in terms oh, wow. of politics, you know, being anti-Zionist, you know, but uh, they didn't try to stop me from doing it. So we organized another demonstration. So there was these two demonstrations of 20,000 people coming together. And uh, at that point, you know, then I think the, uh, it was Nixon actually who, who ended the draft in order to try to calm things down. And then that was uh, the beginning of the end for the uh, US intervention in Vietnam. <laughs> 
yeah you know i i was just thinking about this like um um i was in i, I had i was in a i was in a presser's army for a little bit um before i liberated myself you know and uh, i remember when 9 11 happened and like um everything shifted towards that you know and it's 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 like war and patriotism often supersedes this revolutionary consciousness a lot of times and you, you would think sometimes like people should know but this is why like having this anti-war stance is important and like having having that type of consciousness because um you know even with this russia ukraine thing you know I, i've seen this provoke some kind of patriotism <laughs> and, and, and people that i wouldn't i wouldn't have thought otherwise but then you know they take like this anti um it'll be like an anti-russian stance but it's not an anti-imperialist it's an anti, you know, kind of leftover U.S. propaganda against the Soviet Union, you know, and and I I think that that's what's really causing a lot of this confusion over this subject, you know, and I you know I always try to take the, the anti-war stance just in general because I understood it to be uh, kind of like a imperialism, you know, um, but and yeah, I mean it, it it's I just get confused sometimes because I know people will have these kind of ideas about you know, what we need to do, but then it just gets totally zapped away when, when war is on the, on the horizon. Incredible, yeah, transformation of people. I was on an yeah. academic, you know, like a webinar, you know, like discussing about, you know, retired professors and everything, you know, with white hair, like me, only I didn't get to teach because I was boycotted, you know, so, you know, these, these, these people, you know, like, you know, I start off, you know, with my sort of position on the Donetsk liberation movements, and they had no idea what I was talking about. And these are supposed to be, you know, like the intelligentsia of Canada, you know, the, the cream of the crop, you know, the most educated, most aware people. They had no idea, you know, like what I was talking about. They were just, you know, dismissing you know, everything I said, you know, because I, I, you know, I got some information from Russia today. And, you know, all of a sudden I realized, you know, that I was speaking to a bunch of white supremacists. And these were supposed to be colleagues. You know, but I looked at them, you know, like, and, and they had no comprehension, you know, that minorities, you know, had any rights at all. It was all a matter of the sovereignty of the Ukrainian uh, independent, you know, republic and uh, their frontiers. And they always define a nation by frontiers and not by people. So, you know, everything sort of, you know, slipped away there. I couldn't go back, you know, to that uh, session again with those people. It's, it's something, you know, we call them the rad libs, you know, radical liberals. Ah, yeah. You know, they yeah. sound good, you know, until something, you know, serious comes up and then all of a sudden, you know, they flip. So mm, there's got to be a realignment, you know, of what, uh, what the left is, what the serious revolutionary movement is. We're putting I agree. Emergence, you know. I agree. I agree. It's going to be a realignment. Because now have. it's very clear. It's very clear that some people we thought were our allies are not our allies. In any, or in, that we talk to be strategic allies are just tactical allies at best. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to war, when it comes to um, the international situation, they don't know what they're talking about. And their view is not based on what you talked about, Abraham. Um, Self-determination is not based on uh, autonomy, it's based on, um, uh, the sovereignty of borders, and that's nonsense. Because this country was based on no borders. Well, no borders when nobody got here. There's borders, borders of the indigenous population. Their 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 borders were violated. The whole Western Hemisphere, the borders were violated. Mm -hmm. So historically, to talk about borders and sovereignty is to deny the imperialist conquest of of of. Uh, of uh, Africa and of Asia and of the and, and of the the you know, Western Hemisphere, so I think that you know these are these are difficult conversations, but they have to be put out there to put things in a correct historical perspective. Because we don't have a historical perspective, you just get caught up in theory and politics, and that's what yeah. this situation here shows us. You gotta have historical perspectives. So when black people talk about racism, that's a historical perspective. And we can't just talk about economics, but we always have to make sure that racism is part of the analysis because that's the that's how everything started. With the economics and racism. And we don't bring those together historically, 
You can have all the great King celebrations you want. You can celebrate Cinco de Mayo. You can celebrate Jesus Chavez's birthday. You can celebrate every, you can put a $20 bills with Fan Lou Hammer on it. Forget about um, 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 uh, Soldier and Truth. Forget about everybody. I mean, I mean, you can put Fan Lou Hammer on $20 bills. The, same, the, 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 the reality is, is, you know, still the same. So historical perspective is very, is very important. And this is this question about, about the Ukraine and about what's happening in Donbass. That is not allowed to be talked about in the U.S. media. It is, it, if anybody talks about that, like on my channel, they just take the video off. You can't put it, strike, that kind of thing. So yeah, I agree. I heard something that I, I find incredible, you know, that uh, Germany has banned the letter Z because that's what the, uh, the, the Russian army is using to uh, designate, you know, this operation. I put right. on their tanks. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Wow. Well, uh, wow. You know, like, <laughs> you know, this is uh, really exposing the, the, the Russophobia. I mean, you know, it's incredible, you know, how this capitalist, you know, societies can invent different forms of racism. <laughs> they just invented it, you know, it's just, just like made up, you know, and as long as everybody says the same thing, you know, and everybody, you know, agrees to, to lie. And know that they're lying, but they don't care, you know, like the Zionists do. You know, it's it's incredible how this, you know, human sort of, you know, psychology operates, you know, it's, this, it's so self-defeating that people, you know, uh, choose to uh, adopt, uh, to become an enemy rather than have an enemy in the first place. Create enemies by the use of Zionism, uh, Zionism and racism and all those ideologies. It just it amazes me incredibly. I can't get over it, you know, and it's, it's part of my uh, trauma, you know, from being a refugee kid, you know, of Holocaust, Holocaust survivors who escaped, fortunately, as refugees themselves into the Soviet Union, which saved, you know, 500,000 know, East European Jewish refugees. But, uh, you know, this uh, Ukrainian neo-Nazi, you know, like uh, uh, avant-garde, you know, of uh, what they call Ukrainian nationalism, very dangerous, and I can appreciate, you know, why uh, Russia has taken it so seriously that they've had to intervene in militarily, and uh, their mm. uh, campaign for denazification, you know, is something that I think the Russian public is supporting as well, you know, because they know the threat, they've experienced it, they don't want to experience it again, and so they don't really want uh, the war to end until the uh, problem of the Nazis is taken care of. Any of the soldiers, you know, in the Ukrainian military attacking, you know, are um, you know, infiltrated, you know, by the uh, neo-Nazis there. The main uh, Ukrainian army of 100,000 is sitting on the uh, uh, Elba River, I think it's called, you know, just to prevent Russia from going into the interior, central interior of the Ukraine. But uh, they're not engaged in the assault and the invasion of the uh, Donetsk and Lugansk uh, republics there. So if those uh, invading, you know, aggressive forces are taken care of, you know, by the Russian military, then I think that uh, the, they should be appreciated for having uh, done so in the first place. They took um, off uh, that entire uh, RT channel. Uh, they just ripped it off of YouTube. I, I remember I used to watch uh, Chris Hedges show on contact and it's all completely gone. Yeah. So, you know, that, that you know, free speech well. context <laughs> it's get thrown out the window. It and it's, it should tell us it's controlled media. Yeah. You know, it's like, we're going to tell you what you can know, and we're going to pretend like this is an opposite opinion, but it's it's all accepted opposition. Uh, now, it's officially banned in England. England, the seat of democracy. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah. But I'm still getting it here in Canada, although, you know, from time to time it gets uh, cut off. But England and Europe, you know, what are they fighting for? The free world? They call themselves a free world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they invade Iraq to put democracy there, but yeah. yeah. Libya is such a tragedy as well. I was yeah. working closely with Libya. I was there many times. And uh, they were very serious about, you know, their own revolution and world revolution even, you know. But, you know, they didn't, uh, they thought that they had completed the revolution when they were just beginning it. And so they, mm -hmm. uh, they failed to secure the support of... Uh, the eastern half of the country and, and that was used to undermine them and then they have a civil war still ongoing there that's cooled down but 
uh, if you know the son of Gaddafi, you know, becomes the presidential candidate again, the polls indicate that he would be the most popular choice for president of a republic there. So perhaps you know he could bring back the Jamaria and uh, find a way to reconcile with the uh, with the uh, Benghazi uh, center in the uh, eastern part of the country. So that's something to look forward to. But Yemen, you know, they took care of that war already. You know, the Yemen uh, revolutionaries, you know, the, with their drones that attacked the refineries inside Saudi Arabia. Wow, that's what, you know, made them back down and agree to a ceasefire now for two months. Because, you know, there's, you know, like world oil crisis now. They've painted themselves into a corner. And now, you know, they're cutting their own throats by san sanctioning in Russia. <laughs> it's going to be incredible. I think, too, it's like, um, like, you know, like I was saying, I wanted to ask a question for you guys. Of how do you guys feel about uh, Gaddafi? Because, um, you know, like um, me, I have a Pan-African background. I both with like AAPRP. And, you know, Gaddafi is kind of held up as a hero. But then there's another side, you know, that would kind of say um, he's kind of like a dictator. Um, I've, I've kind of always learned that there's balance, you know, um, but I also think it's, it's somewhat uh, your perspective. Um, but, it, it, you know, it's almost like if you say something negative about the doctor, you're feeding into the American propaganda, you know, but then you don't want to not critique the yeah. things that need to be critiqued. Yeah. It was the same problem with uh, the Trotskyists who were accused of uh, being traitors and uh, imperialist agents, you know, because they criticized Stalinism. But the problem is that it's, it, it gets complicated, you know, because one of the factions of the Trotskyists that broke off, a Schachtman faction, some of them turned into, you know, apologists for U.S. imperialism. And they started to turn into neocons <laughs> from the original Trotskyist movement. So it's, you know... <laughs> It certainly uh, ha has a sort of a tendency to it, but it wasn't the actual position of, uh, of what Trotskyism, you know, put together as a critique of Stalinism. It was, my, you know, a revolutionary critique, not a reactionary critique. Same thing goes, you know, in what you were saying. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, 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 I think that you asked about Gaddafi. Um, I, my view on that brother is is evolving, but all, uh, what I can say now about uh, Muammar Gaddafi is that the West feared him. They feared his movement in Africa, and he's dead now. Yeah, and that's why he's dead. Mm -hmm. um, the the um, the the use of um, the NATO war, NATO, NATO. You remember NATO? to attack Libya, to destabilize it, to bring back slavery in, into Libya, had to be done with the death of Gaddafi. Hmm. He could not be allowed to live in any way. And this is what they do to leaders that they, they don't have to be vanguard revolutionaries per se, but if, they, if their view on how to organize their country and the region um, differs greatly with that of the West, um, they certainly will face destabilization and possibly death. Hmm. And I think, I'm, just, um, I'm just putting it straight. Gaddafi hmm. shows us the importance of not, I'm, I'm not saying he made mistakes negotiating with the West. However, once they know you're weak militarily, they'll come after you militarily. That's what they do. Russia, a few, a few days ago, fired a weapon in, into a, um, uh, supply depot in Ukraine. It had never been used before in war. And it, was, it was a signal to the West. We have weapons that you don't know how, even how, how to track. You have to do that. Again, we're not talking about how we fight on the streets and how we fight politically. It's a whole different kind of fight when it comes to war and, and uh, negotiations and that kind of stuff. It's, it's a whole different mind field and we don't have as People in this country, our struggles, the way we've carried out hasn't been based on missiles and that kind of, no, it hasn't. So lots of, we, we kind of don't, we're not into like studying that more. I think we need to study that more, how war actually carries, is carried out. But Gaddafi was a great man. He's dead because he was, he's dead because he, 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 he is a great man. Now I think we should learn from anything we can from the, our, our leaders who have, who have been taken out because of U.S. imperialism.
And that's why Akhenavi isn't with us anymore. Mm-hmm. Because of NATO and, and the US. And it's, it's, and it's, it's very, very tragic. Yeah, very true. We have a few minutes left on the 40 minute deadline, you know, okay. by Zoom. So uh, um, Zahir, you know, if you'd like to make some concluding remarks and then we'll have our video together. Um, I think for me, um, the biggest thing uh, that we um, we mentioned is realignment, right? A realignment of the left and, and to these movements. There has to be, the, you know, I, I remember reading the New African Theoretical Journals and they talk about rebuild, you know, and build to win. And we, I almost feel like at this point in time, we may have to focus on setting a new foundation and even for another generation to come. But I, I feel like it's just been like a, somebody dropped a bomb on everything and we're just still trying to, we're scattered, still trying to figure ourselves out. So I think realignment is is um, key. And also uh, we do do a political education class, community movement builders twice a month. And I would like to invite you guys over to uh, one of our classes whenever you guys have the time. Thank you. And as far as I'm concerned, I think one thing I learned from this, from this conversation is the importance of using the internet and conversations to make connections, to find out what other comrades and people in the struggle are doing around the country and to build connections with them and, and find things we can unite around and get busy doing, doing the work that, that we need to do. So thank you very much.